Good afternoon, everyone. How are you guys doing? Come on, you can do better. Yay. All right. I'm going to actually try and keep to time, unlike Richard. Is he still here? No, didn't hear my jab. OK. Um, welcome. We are going to talk about VCs adapting to investing in Web 3.0. I'm going to let all the panelists quickly introduce themselves and tell you um, who they are, what fund they're with, and a little bit about their fund. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Min Tio, and I lead investments in Europe for Consensus Labs. Um, Consensus is a global software company that builds decentralized infrastructure and applications on Ethereum. And our Web3 investment group uh, consists of an accelerator, an incubator, and a VC fund. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm uh, Alex Solkovnikov. I'm a partner and co-founder of an early stage venture fund called Semantic Ventures. We spend a lot of time on investing in this space. Hi, I'm Max. Um, I'm part of the Fabric team. Um, and we are an early stage fund investing in Web3 uh, quite broadly uh, across tokens, equities, and other um, asset classes that might come up in the future. Just a quick check. Can you guys hear that mic? Yeah? OK. Hello. Cool. Yeah. Um, so let's get started. So why does this space need dedicated funds? Won't the large institutionals do it all? So I think w one of the ways to, to think about that is um, when you have radical new business models that emerge, you generally need new funds. When you have new ways of de-risking your investment, you need new funds. So one of the spaces that has their own focused fund is, for example, biotech. And if you think about why that's the case, it's because in biotech, um, you have to pour in a bunch of money and do a bunch of research, and all of a sudden you solve the problem and you either cure cancer or you don't, and then your company is worth a lot of money. Um, in these Web3 ecosystems, you have completely new business models which are arising as well. It started off with taxing volatility, but then we moved on to payment mo tokens, governance tokens, work tokens, and even pr providing UI, UX for some of these decentralized networks. And all of these have new metrics that you have to look into, you have new um, data feeds that you have to track, uh, whether that could be, for example, for MakerDAO, the number of CDPs that are opened, for a work token, the participation rate, or even if for something like Bitcoin, the hash rate, uh, which are not traditional metrics that a generalist fund would be looking at. Um, if you're a generalist fund, you're probably used to looking at uh, monthly recurring revenue and churn rates in SaaS companies, and those apply across healthcare, across fintech, uh, but they're quite different in the Web3 space. Um, and so that's one of the reasons for which um, you need a dedicated fund. I think you always need people who have incredibly high conviction in investing, and that could be a part of a specialized fund or it could be a part of a gen generalized fund. But this space is evolving so quickly that uh, you need to be spending majority of your time as an investor in order to understand what's going on. There are new concepts that are being created every day, and um, in order to be able to take risk early, you need to be highly convicted in uh, what you're doing. The other piece is um, active participation and value to projects that you invest in. Uh, again, early stage funds would be able to take, and dedicated funds would be able to take a more active role, I believe, because they understand um, the technology slightly better. But at the same time, I do believe um, there is a role for generalized funds, especially at later stage, where they could be massively helpful to projects based on their expertise uh, and great history and network of helping founders at later stages. Min, do you have anything to add, or should I move on? All right, let's mix it up a little bit, because you brought up revenue. So how do you negate the point that no real revenue has been created by blockchain companies other than the exchanges and mining companies? I think with regards to revenue, it's really related to new business models. So from my perspective, a lot of the revenue that's being generated today, while it's an impressive uh, milestone for the company, I do sometimes question whether or not it's sustainable revenue. A big part of investing into this ecosystem and enabling technology where Web2 technology cannot enable is the proliferation of new business models. Um, I think on this front, um, some of what's happening in China is quite interesting, where you know, if you look at today's world, like in sort of the developed Western world, um, you know, all the big giants have 80% of their revenues through subscriptions or through ads or through transactions. Um, in a lot of the Chinese giants, like they're completely diversified. 
um, and you know a lot of it focuses on time-based, um, very relevant consumer empowerment. Um, I'm quite interested in seeing those business models uh, proliferate. Uh, however, I don't think the tech is quite really there to enable the foundations for those revenue models. Um, you know, in that sense, that's how we sort of think about it, that things will happen in phases. Um, probably in the next 80, 18 to 24 months, monetization models that make sense will definitely be one of the core focus. I don't particularly agree with the question. <laughs> I think there are highly successful companies that are making a lot of money that exists outside of mining and exchanges. Um, especially in the security space where there are some startups which are quietly working and earning significant revenues in, in, I including say the Ministry of Defense of the United States for example and they're just not publicizing their activity uh, massively but are, are, are very very successful however um, in general you're probably right to me it seems like a matter of timing just the evolution of the space developed in such a way that first you needed ability to secure decentralized networks and that led to miners pro proliferate and become quite successful. Second, you needed people to be able to become part of this economy and that led to exchanges become successful. And it just turned out that it takes seven to 10 years for companies to become super successful and therefore what started 10 years ago, we now see can bring significant returns and revenue. And then the question is, rather than how come it's just exchanges and miners, to me the question is, what is the opportunity for the next wave of companies to invest in, which will bring that next wave um, of significant revenue and returns to investors? And I believe there are already companies that have been started after that that will achieve that in a few years' time. Yeah, and I'd add, so that's looking at mostly the equity perspective. We have traditional companies that are providing services um, to the space, whether it be mining, uh, custody exchange, um, or any other services they can think of, and they charge a monthly fees or some transaction fee. Um, but when you look at some of these new business models around, for example, work tokens, um, you have to have a rational reason as to why you think that the aggregate of the individuals holding these work tokens who will get a right to prov provide future work in these networks will have a rational route to creating revenues for themselves. And then you aggregate them all together and you get a certain amount of revenue that's generated by the network. And that allows you to value these networks in the future. So it's true that currently a lot of these work tokens are mostly um, focused on block rewards. Um, and most of these block rewards are more anti-dilutive uh, than revenue really. Um, but in the future, you can imagine that, for example, with LifePeer, once there's actually transcoding going on on LifePeer, uh, there'll be a certain amount of revenue flowing to the LifePeer transcoders. Um, LifePeer is a fairly recent project. It's, well, in blockchain terms, maybe it's not quite so recent, but it's two, three years old. Um, and they've recently launched um, their, their main chain and are starting to have a certain set of transcoders that are ready to transcode as there's more and more traffic, but that's sort of building up. And the second point to that is that for a long time, we were thinking about these networks as um, build them and people will come build applications on top of them. Um, that might have worked for 0x where some relayer is built on top of 0x. It might have worked for Augur where um, one or two companies have built on top of Augur, but even now we've seen Vale, for example, fork Augur off. Um, so we're seeing more and more of these protocols who are thinking about the fact that they need to build their first viral application that actually drives uh, traffic on top of their networks as well. Um, and so we're seeing that with Orchid, who are building their first VPN. We're seeing it with Keith, who are building their first application on top of it. A lot of these networks are building their first applications that should um, drive their own initial sort of sets of users. Um, and those will be generating transactions um, or will be using the network and will be generating fees, which will go beyond just block rewards, and that's where revenues will come from. Um, and even if you take some of the sort of very earliest networks, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, those are largely based on block rewards right now. On Bitcoin, you've got about $15 million worth of block rewards every day, and you've got about $700,000 worth of transaction fees per day. On Ethereum, you've got about $2.5 million worth of block rewards and 70K of transaction fees. So the actual transaction fees are still pretty low, and we're still at a stage where it's heavily subsidized by block rewards, but we're slowly moving in the direction of having more and more transaction fees come in. Thank you. Um, so both Min and Alex, both of you guys spoke a little bit about the future trends and what's happening next. So why don't I give you guys an opportunity to kind of tell us what do you think the landscape looks like over the next year to two years? Where are we going to get those companies that break out? Um, what do they look like? 
think we'll see a massive evolution of solutions happening in the, in the security and cryptography space in general. Uh, we think there will be new models to secure networks and applications that are going to be coming up, which will attract significant revenues um, and, and provide a lot of value. We also get excited, not momentarily, but about things that are properly transformational and look after global markets. For instance, trade finance and supply chain is one, and you know, one of our portfolio companies, Centrifuge, is tackling a market which is worth $180 trillion uh, dollars in, in purely business vo invoices flying around. Um, so w when you look at that opportunity and we, when, when you look at benefits of decentralized networks and efficiency of the new type of infrastructure that those enable, you really look at significant opportunities and potential returns that you can unlock. Um, so consensus as Ethereum specialists, we really like to think about Ethereum as a global settlement layer. Um, and if you just look at, you know, say the size of global markets, right? Global equities markets, 70 trillion. The credit markets, three times of that. Derivatives markets, four times of the credit markets. Anything that requires sort of global transfer, uh, global distribution, um, you know, we think there's space to be disrupted. We talk, to, talk a lot about DeFi. I think we think there's loads of opportunity in global commerce as well. Um, another theme that we're really excited about unfolding um, over the next uh, sort of the near term is sort of the intersection of virtual worlds and digital identities. Um, you can say it's sort of a, you know, an extension of like, you know, how does sort of gaming as a theme uh, manifests itself on blockchain, but I think we're also looking at the more um, direct distribution of content uh, to the consumer. Uh, how do we create like really, really rich virtual worlds where people can find utility and meaning, um, particularly sort of how it meets with all the global trends of like people being more remotely distributed and all of that. Um, you know, we, we're looking at a few co like projects that are a little bit more moonshot-like um, in having that vision and pretty excited to back them. I guess that covers some of the um, sort of the vertical areas that that, can, that will be very exciting in the coming years. Uh, but thinking more about some of the mechanisms that I think are going to be very exciting in in the coming sort of 12 to 18 to 24 months. Um, one aspect I was briefly touched upon earlier today on, on one of the panels is the decoupling or the dissociation uh, between uh, fundraising and distribution of some of these tokens. Uh, so historically, with ICOs, you had a single event, which was uh, launching a token, selling it to a bunch of people, uh, probably not very targeted, and that money um, came under question from sort of a securities perspective. Um, going forward, we think we'll have a lot more equity rounds um, from some of the early stage founders, uh, aligning interests, whether it's information rights, government rights, as well as future token rights uh, with their investors. Um, and then there'll be a huge set of tokens that will be distributed to the right people, to the people that will actually be using the tokens uh, for their real purpose. Uh, so if, it, if that's a work token, for example, on LifePeer, it's making sure that those tokens get distributed to the people who will be transcoding video on LifePeer. Um, and so we had a panel earlier on, on sort of ICOs, IEOs, work drops, lock drops, uh, airdrops, or any other mechanism to distribute tokens. But that will be extremely interesting to find out how, if you have a token that needs to be held by a bunch of data scientists, how do you make sure that a bunch of data scientists get a hold of that token and not some speculator who will put it on an exchange and wait for it to go up in price before selling it? Uh, so that's one thing that is going to be evolving quite rapidly over the coming months, in my opinion. And the second point is, as we're seeing more and more of these work and staking tokens come live. Uh, I think a lot of investors promised to be participating within these networks. Um, and as these networks come live, they'll either have to, have to live up to that um, or let down the founders. Um, we're seeing a lot of staking providers come up. Uh, we had stake.us stake and stake capital on earlier. And we fully intend to work with them to provide um, staking solutions for ourselves, but also for some of our co-investors, um, where we see that actually, as investors, you're more than just capital. You become an infrastructure to allow anyone else to participate within, within the network who doesn't necessarily want to run wants to who doesn't necessarily want to run the infrastructure. Uh, so that evolution of the role of the investor is, is pretty interesting to us, and, and we're hoping that it, it develops quite quickly over the next coming year. Great. Okay, so I'm going to ask two more questions, and then I want some audience participation. So start thinking of a question if you have one. Um, where is the highly anticipated death of venture capital? Where do we stand with that? What's the status? What's happening? I guess we're still all here right now, uh, so we're okay. 
Um, but I, I think it's not really a death of venture capital. It's probably a recalibration of venture capital. Um, as I just mentioned before, it's uh, understanding that you're not just capital anymore. There's a bit more venture in it as well. You have to get your hands dirty. You have to start participating within these networks. You might have to um, prove um, that you will participate in these networks to even get an allocation to invest in them. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other sort of adaptations that can be made to venture capital in this open source world where you can think through recruiting and sourcing talent via GitHub because it's all sort of openly available. Uh, there's a lot more community building uh, than in sort of traditional venture. Um, but these are all adaptations that we're making, but we don't at all see the sort of the world of venture going away. In the end, capital allocators, whether they be retail or private or institutional, um, they will probably still want to entrust their capital with people who are fully focused on this space, especially when we're talking about a highly technical set of innovations, um, which you need to be focusing your entire time on. Um, it's not going to be, um, venture, I don't think venture capitals will be, venture capital funds will be removed anytime soon. I think there is one specific market where there is a great opportunity to disrupt venture capital. And that's, that comes from the fact that what decentralized platforms will allow you to do in the future is to generate value um, outside of or um, bypassing the central parties such as corporations and businesses. Um, it's actually quite interesting where we spend majority of our time is and efforts and skills is contributing to the value that for the most part corporations get eventually. If you are able to um, tokenize your time and your skill and your knowledge, and you're able to let other people invest in that, actually the produce of um, your skill and contribution could then, and the value from that could, could then go directly to people who invested in that. And most likely that will be your relatives and people and friends and people who are early uh, familiar with you and believed in you early. Um, so I think one interesting opportunity is for us to invest in models that enable that. Um, but on the other side, these sort of opportunities will kind of create a market for disrupting venture capital invest investment because a lot of the value will not accrue in uh, the coffers of corporations and businesses and companies, but will flow back to individuals and devices and machines. I think related to a Alex's point, um, the part that I think we will start seeing change is not so much in an investment, but actually in the exit. So if you think about a lot of you know what we have right now with a lot of VC funding over the last seven to 10 years, we have this huge illiquidity stack. So a lot of companies that have raised billions in venture funding that are waiting to either go public, get sold to a corporation, or get sold to some sort of private equity player, um, I think what we actually have is new methods to allow companies to stay independent without being reliant on private funding that is just determined by a handful of funds. You know, you can sort of stream dividends to your investors through security tokens and actually just keep your company as a going concern for a longer time um, without feeling that you have to impact, you know, your investors, your LPs returns. Um, so I think that's quite interesting and I hope, I hope we'll see that over the next couple of years play, play out. Um, are there any audience questions or should I keep going with the ones that I have? Awesome. All right. Is that say Ben on your name tag? I can't see that far. Hello. Um, my name is Ben Whitby. I do crypto compliance. I think the ICOs were an amazing um, initiative by the community. I think that where we're going to struggle is trying to match all the various different regulatory frameworks. So how do we not, how do we, how does the next wave of ICOs, as in the true ICOs, how do they establish the inclusion of the US that the first wave excluded? Uh, and that's without having to go to the STO market. So we can actually have global, a global position where we can raise capital globally. And we can also deploy that capital globally as well. So you don't need to necessarily be in San Francisco or London. How do we? What what steps do we need to do to take to make that happen? To make that a reality? I think the issue is not the regulation itself, because regulators are there for a reason in order to protect consumers. Um, 
I think the issue is in disclosures and transparency of, of information. We're actually both investors uh, in a company called Misari in New York, which is bringing that transparency to the space by encouraging self-regulation and self-disclosures by projects. And that's going to be incredibly important to the space, I think, and will help get regulators on board as well. Of course, there will always be a lag between a regulator understanding what's going on and a regulation that is sensible coming out, hopefully sensible. But the more transparency and the more tools we have in order to reduce information asymmetry between founders, projects, investors, and the public, the better it is for the whole space, in my view. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. Um, on the regulatory and compliance side, um, you know, we're a US company, so we have no choice but to take it very seriously. Um, you know, we have something called the Brooklyn Project where we have regular dialogue with the SEC and we have, you know, the same sort of relationships with the FCA and EU. Um, I will say that at the same time, though, if you look at sort of, you know, financial markets that preceded this, so OTC, derivatives, a lot of it happened without the U.S. first because the regulator was so slow. Um, so part of that will also happen. And I think, you know, crypto is just inherently a global business. Um, so uh, it's, it's quite likely that innovation will happen outside the U.S. first. Sorry, just to quickly add, because I was sitting backstage and hearing the conversation between Europe and the US, and we are, after all, in London, which for now is still in Europe. Um, I think in the US, you have a single or two, two regulators, the SEC and the CFTC, which are pushing a lot of regulation. In Europe, you've got 28 states, which are trying to be as competitive as possible to attract the best talent. Um, so you've got a lot of smaller countries, whether it be Switzerland with Zug or Malta or Gibraltar. Um, or even France, for example, with Bruno Le Maire, who's openly stated that he wants France to become a, one of the sort of leading blockchain nations of the world to attract the best talent. Um, that all leads to a much more competitive environment that actually attracts a lot of founders. So from our perspective, it's almost a regulatory arbitrage that's quite positive. Um, we hope that the US also uh, comes up with a friendlier uh, regulation, or at least clearer regulation about what can and can't be done. Um, and that sort of should move them forward as well. But Whenever we're talking to US founders or when you're listening to podcasts, they quite often like to ask sort of at the quick fire round at the end, what is the one regulation you would change? It's quite often not a single regulation they would change. It's quite simply just that they want clarity to know what they're doing and where they stand. And that's still missing. Okay, we have time for one more question and then I'm gonna do a quick fire. Anyone else? Hey, uh, piggybacking off of your uh, last comment, Max, uh, do you think the recent SEC uh, guidance related to the Howey test is not enough clarity uh, in this regard? So I guess we could link it back to the kick and kin situation which we have right now, um, which um, is, so kick is a, is a mess messaging application uh, that sold a token I think about a year and a bit ago um, in an ICO, and now um, they decided not to settle with the SEC on their disagreement and are going to court over it. Um, I think that will probably bring a lot more clarity, actually. Um, I think you'll probably have this setting where sort of right now you have Ethereum and Bitcoin right here, which uh, sort of the chairman and some representatives of the SEC and the CFTC have quite openly said is not a security, and you have like full-on security tokens here, and Kin sit, sits somewhere in between. So depending on how, what that outcome is, if it's not a security, then anything um, on the left of that, which is sort of the green space then is completely clear and anything on the right of that is still in the gray space. If it turns out to be a security, then you have sort of this gray space between Ethereum and Bitcoin and, uh, and Kin and the complete red space between total securities and, and, and Kick and Kin. Um, I think the problem with that is that, um, and not particular picking on Kick and Kin, but uh, some of these models are um, quite novel business models, uh, which are much closer to collective capitalism where you have a whole a much bigger set of contributors and supply side providers of work uh, who are coming together to provide the work in the network and who are getting properly rewarded for it. Um, and we're trying to apply very old laws to that. And now maybe the, the application of the law changes um, and maybe that's sort of a precedent that might be set with kick and kin. Um, but tr taking the Howey test, which um, if I recall correctly is actually based off of some uh, orange plantations um, about 70, 80 years ago, uh, seems almost a bit absurd. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up, um, but I'm gonna ask each panelist to share with you guys the secret 
What is the most undervalued project out there right now? So I'm selling a piece of land on Decentraland. <laughs> uh, high access to roads, very central. And if you come find me afterwards, we can make a pretty good deal. And I'm pretty sure it will be undervalued in a year's time. I think some of the most uh, undervalued projects in this space are identity projects. Whoever is going to solve identity in this space is going to be very, very valuable. Um, I think one space that's both overvalued and undervalued at the same time is the privacy space. It's mainly being funded on the celebrity of the founder, given you know monetization is still very obscure. But I think you know there'll be loads of great companies that really nail the actual monetization strategy and build great products utilizing privacy protocols. Um, otherwise, related to um, Max's comment, I have a cheese wizard to sell. That's a new project by Crypto Kitties. It's a very fun game. <laughs> what level is it? <laughs> it's a fire wizard. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. Um, have a great rest of the afternoon. <laughs>